going to be master of the government or is government going to be master over you? Now, how do we claim mastery over people? Or not so much over them, but how do we ensure that they aren't trying to be masters over us? As they have treated us like children, because we were acting like children, so must we treat them like children. You, who here are most our parents, I imagine? Everyone have kids? Are you not masters over your kids? Why? Well, when you were younger, when they were younger, maybe. When they were younger, what makes you master over them is your ability to grab them and raise them up. They come and they try kicking you in the shin. You laugh at them. Ha, 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 that doesn't hurt. And you raise them up. Who's in charge now? You are clearly the one who has the power if you can raise up the people in government. And the trick to this, why can you do this from your kids? Why is it possible for you to accept your kids doing things that you might not like and yet you don't get all angry with them as you would with the government? Why? Because you love them. When they were born, you allowed your heart to expand and that expansion of the heart gave you the power to raise them up. You're going to be treating the government in the exact same fashion. You're going to allow your heart to expand and you are going to have power over them because you know that they are the children. You have the moral high ground. You're acting mature. You are willing to deal with them on whatever level they want, but you have the power. And once they start recognizing that, if they come at you, and, oh, put them up, put them up. Oh, really? <laughs> You're so cute. Come here. Kick them up. <laughs> now get in your room. When you bring out that attitude, it's far different. They, I had to go to jail a couple of times. I mean, I, I, in this action, it's not easy. You know, I've been placed under arrest. But when they came and arrested me, they, oh, Mr. Menard, we have to place you under arrest. Okay, fine. Sat there for, with my coffee. Finally, the paddy wagon pulled up. Okay, well, we got to put cuffs on you now. Okay, fine. Put it on. And it's under protest and arrest every step of the way. He noted the protest. I get into the holding cell, and I get in there, and there's like 15 people in there. I'm like... So who's here under statutory charges? I'm going to teach you about the law. Two, Fifteen <laughs> seconds later, the door opens. They grab me, take me out. They couldn't get me out of that holding cell fast enough, eh? And they're asking me to sign a return, an ROR, a return on recognizance. And I'm not signing that. Well, you have to sign it. You'll go back in that holding cell. Fine, bunch of people in there to teach. <laughs> Okay, you just sit there. They, he, he, the sergeant, he tried intimidating me. He, come here, come here. Because I was sitting over there. You just sit there and you make up your mind. So he calls me over. Don't you try to intimidate me. You're going to sign this document. I'm saying, okay, fine. Listen, you want me to sign it? Yes, I do. I'll sign it. But it's under protest and duress. <sighs> fine, just sign it. So I signed it under duress. As I give it to him, you know that signature isn't really there. <laughs> Take it, got out. They didn't want me in there. If you go through this enough times, they get to the point where they know that you know what is right, what is wrong, and you're willing to sacrifice for it. If when you go through these procedures, you are acting with respect to the cops, if you aren't questioning so much, I try not to question their intelligence, their integrity, or their intent. Merely the meaning of the words that they're using to claim authority and their knowledge of what those words mean. If they don't have that information, they should just back right off. And the cops, at least out in Vancouver and B.C., they're coming around. They are coming around in a huge way. People are getting tickets saying, that's a bill of exchange and I want the original. Uh, another one. Let's <laughs> close that one. Here's a warning. And they're not doing it anymore. How do we get to this point, though? How do we get them to recognize that they're the nanny and we have grown up and they have no more power as nanny over us? It's about how we treat them, about how we act. If we're shitting our pants, pardon the language, ladies and sensitive guys, but if we're pooping our drawers, Nanny has a right and a duty to put diapers on us, and she will do that. If you're throwing a tantrum, Nanny has the power and the right to come grab you, throw you in your room until you settle down. If you're rebellious, Nanny's got a right to put limits upon you as long as you're in the house. Nanny is tired. She wants us to stop rebelling. If you get to the point where you say, Nanny, I'm not rebelling anymore. I'm just old enough now, and I'm in charge of the house, and uh, you're not telling me what time I'm going to bed. I'm telling you I'm going out all night. I'll be back at 7. You'll have breakfast ready. You take power over them when you act within that, that capacity. If you treat them like children, if you aren't shitting your pants, you're not throwing tantrums, and what I sense on a lot of, a lot of the people in, in the, the freedom movement, they're very rebellious towards everything that they're doing. 
We want to get away from that. We don't want to be in permanent conflict with these people. They want us in conflict. That generates the revenue. We want to find the place of peace and the place of abundance. So how do we do this? When they're coming at us and they're making ludicrous demands upon us that we know we could make upon them, how do we find that balance? Since it is about peace, and we are going to be the adults here, what I think of, think of mud pies. Your kid comes to you, and they've got a mud pie, and they say, here, look, mommy, daddy, I baked you a pie. And you say, that's not a pie, that's a bunch of mud with some rabbit droppings spelling out I love you and a bunch of leaves on it. I'm not eating that. Your ch kid's going to cry. You dishonored them. You've locked them out. I mean, people say, oh, that's not a real bill. We don't have real money. There's no real commercial uh, uh, transactions available to them. If you order your kid to bake you a pie and then you lock them out of the kitchen, you don't even give them access to the pantry, this mud pie is all they've got. Now, how do you deal with a mud pie when a kid comes and brings it to you? To make them not cry, to accept it, you say, oh, that's a beautiful mud pie. Thank you very much. I'm going to eat that right up. Hey, I've got to share it with you. Go get some cutlery. Even a four-year-old knows, I don't want to eat that. <laughs> well, you want me to eat it? Here, look, I'll taste some. You put a little on your... Hey, isn't that Barney? They turn around, you throw the mud away. Oh, that was a beautiful mud pie. Go get me some more. I want another mud pie, and this time you're going to eat it. When you, if you can accept everything they bring you, merely as mud pie, merely as a kid trying to serve you, trying to be nice to you, they're trying to give you a service, regardless of whether or not you accept it as edible, then you start having power over them because you can accept without generating conflict. You can conditionally accept. You say, I accept whatever it is you're giving me upon this condition. You place your own conditions and you make those conditions too difficult for them to, to fulfill. <clears throat> this is what the whole acceptance for value routine is about. You've all heard of acceptance for value? Trying to explain accepted for value, acceptance for value. Change the acceptance to accepted, change the for to as, and you accept it as valuable. Someone comes and brings you a mud pie, and you say, I accept that this is valuable. You give them evidence of this, now they can go to a third party. If someone gave me a document, a remittance, and I take it and I say, I accept that this is valuable, now give it back to them. Now you have two parties who have both claimed that a certain document has value. It's a valuable document and it must be because two people have just accepted it as such. You can now take this document to the third party, not me, my fiduciary agent or the government, whoever you want to direct it to, but that third party must accept that this document, this mud pie, is real pie because you've accepted it as such. They use tricky language, like acceptance for value took me a long time to try to understand what they were doing there until I said accept it as valuable. Okay, I can see that. It's evidence that someone provided you with a service. They might have been a government agent just bringing you mud pie. It might be service in the form of a ticket. It might be service in the form of a summons or anything like that. But all they're doing is trying to serve you. The problem with acceptance for value is knowing what you can and cannot accept and how to deal with something. If you get a notice, you shouldn't be accepting that for value because all it is is a notice. You deal with a notice with your own notice. And you take their notice. What I used to do is I'd take their notice, I'd write on the back, here's my notice, uh, and it's a di notice of discharge of alternative notice or, or notice of discharge of notice by way of seeking clarification. They're trying to communicate with me. I don't know what your words mean. What does this word mean? What does this word mean? What does this word mean? Balls in your court. And they, they never want to start playing that. If you get a remittance, and this is where when we went through with Rob with the whole uh, parking ticket issue, the end result was them sending a remittance. We looked that up. A remittance is a, a specie of money sent by one merchant to another, but it has to be signed. Look at the money in your pocket. It has a signature. It has two parties accepting it as valuable. Those you can sign. Those you can assign value to. You say, I accept this as valuable. You give it back to them. They now have something that they can take and pay. What we found with the parking tickets, they would send you this remittance, and what they want you to do is not touch that, but send that back, that original document, with a check for the value of the remittance. So they are getting two species of money. They've got 80 bucks in that envelope, not 40. And they're using this check to act as in an administrative capacity for you, and they are adding value to that. It's called twinning a stream of revenue, and it's highly unlawful. 
and we caught them at it in Vancouver. So, it, and when we first did it, the first time we did it, they accepted it. They, they didn't want us doing it over and over. Yeah, they claimed it was a typo. We 